Today we have with us Gary Hensley. Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. Mark, thanks for having me. So Gary founded and sold two education technology companies. So why don't you kick us off with your background? Sure. Um, you know, I, I have been in the education space, but I would say at, at my heart, or ed tech space, but my heart is really in education. So I started off as a teacher um, in Southern California. Before I got into teaching, I, I did a brief stint in sales, actually, um, and then went into teaching, which, you know, I think in retrospect ended up being such a benefit to me. Um, because I took a sales perspective into my eighth grade chemistry and physics <laughs> class. <laughs> um, you know, I really looked at teaching um, as I had to sell them on this idea that science was really important and I had to find really creative ways to do that before they even cared about anything else. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about that um, when I created my lesson plans and when I was thinking about, okay, I have a bunch of eighth graders sitting in the room who most likely don't care about this unless I give them some reason uh, to care about it. And so I started thinking about like, in a classroom or even in, you know, where we were at, um, there's everything that was around us was invented by somebody that said, hey, this could be better if we did it this way. And to me, that's really kind of what science was about is that idea of, wow, this is cool, but what if it was like this? You know, what if we could do that? Um, and that question, you know, leads to innovation. It leads to um, all kinds of cool stuff that other people benefit from. So that was my perspective on science in the classroom. And the kids loved it. They, they had a great time thinking about, oh, wow, yeah, I could fight. You know, what if I did this? You know, what if I did this differently? Um, so that's kind of how I got started was kind of with that mindset uh, of teaching. Um, then I moved into administration at the urging of my principal, who was really encouraging, uh, has been a great mentor. Even to this day, he texted me. He was asking me if I was going to be at a conference. Um, and I went into administration and out of the classroom. And in, in that kind of leap out, um, you're not you know, with your 180 kids anymore, you're, you're starting to look at the school system as a system. Um, and in that role as an AP, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to the assistant principal's office before. Of course, you've never have been, but <laughs> <laughs> generally speaking, you kind of know what happens in the assistant principal's office. Um, and so I, I was dealing with a small set of the school and the problems were really big sometimes. And um, I got frustrated with my job because I felt like I was doing a disservice to these kids because by the time I saw them, the problems were so big mm -hmm. and it was so late in the year, you know, um, it would be April and you've had, you know, two or more Fs and your, your attendance has, you know, reached a critical point and, you know, there's only two more months of school left. What am I supposed to do for you? What am I supposed to tell your family? Um, and so that question kind of haunted me. And so I started looking into data. And were there indicators that I had at my disposal at the time that could help me better assess which kids I needed to see? Because there was, there was one of me and there was 1,200 of them. Wow. So there was no way that I could do that without good data. Um, even if I saw each kid individually and just kind of went through, I could never get through enough conversations fast enough to find the right kids. So I needed some help. And so that's what I ended up um, working on nights and weekends, pulling data and Excel sheets. And, um, and then I realized that there was. There was this way to do it better, and it was this algorithm that I kind of came up with um, that I'd watched the stock markets and how they took indices and they took multiple data points and combined them into something that kind of made sense. It's like, oh, yeah, an up arrow. I don't know what math that was, but I know an up arrow meant it was good and a down arrow <laughs> meant it was bad. And so that's how we tried to take all this complicated math that we were doing behind the scenes and present it in a way to know, hey, how is the stock of that particular student doing at that moment and do I need to do something about it um, as an assistant principal so that was my my very first product it was called integrade um, and that eventually was acquired by Pearson education so one of the largest education companies probably the largest education company in the world and that was an absolute uh, amazing journey to, to go through that so um, 
So that's kind of a little, little of my background. Yeah. It was a little bit of the, the first first company, but um, I was actually listening to Dean Draco, who's one of our investors in, in Living Tree, majority investor, and he was talking about, uh, you know, he never felt like he was smart enough to create things like uh, just out of the blue, but it was always environmental that, that created those things, like his own problem that he was trying to solve, and I'm very much the, the same way. It's like there was a problem that I was having and I thought other people in my position might also be having that same problem. So I went to go try to solve, you know, that that problem through data. So I love that story. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the process of, of how you grew Integrate to, a, to position it for sale by Pearson. Yep. Um, you know, at what point did you guys realize, hey, we really have like a competitive advantage and product market fit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if I would have put it in those terms at that time. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, we started to grow. We were very, very small. And I initially got a grant. I pitched this idea to a lady in my school by the name of Jane Garland. And she loved the idea so much. She said, I will give you money um, if you build that. I mean, you know, you didn't even have it yet. But if you were to build something like that, I would buy it. And so she was able to kind of seed some money for us and to to go through that. And so I started selling locally in Southern California, anywhere I could drive to, essentially. Um, any friend I could tap and say, hey, you know, we used to work together. You know, can I tell you about what we're trying to do? And so we slowly grew in Southern California. I had a... Um, I took that initial money and hired what ended up being my co-founder uh, and CTO. And so he was in Florida and I was in Southern California. And so we would just, you know, iterate every night and then I'd go and sell the next morning and we'd iterate at night and sell the next morning. Um, and then we did a, a friends and family round. And so we got a little bit more cash. And so we were able to go to further places with that cash. So we could go to Northern California. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we had grown like that for about two years. And there was this, um, I had an advisor that I had kind of gotten on board with us. And he was like, you should come out to this conference in New York. And to be honest with you, I had enough money for the flight. <laughs> um, that was about it. And I didn't know where I was going to stay when I got there, but I just knew I needed to go to this thing. And so I um, booked my Booked my ticket out there. Uh, my co-founder drove up, and it was this pitch competition um, through SIIA. SIIA. Um, and so it was an incubator pitch competition. And long story short is we ended up winning that. Wow. Um, and we won in two categories, uh, most likely to turn a profit and most likely to succeed. And with that, in that room that day was Pearson. Mm -hmm. uh, this this guy by the name of George Kane, who actually works for a um, uh, foundation out in uh, California. Uh, he worked for Apple for a little while. Super smart guy, but he was in the room that day. And we won, and there was all, you know, there's a bunch of people, and you're shaking a lot of hands. But he didn't come over and shake my hand. And I was like, that guy's from Pearson. I was like, I'm going to go say hello to him. <laughs> and I did. And he's like, hey, I really like what you're doing. We should stay in touch. Um, and that was the beginning, little did I know, of the acquisition process. Um, he had pitched this internally to some folks at Power School. We started some conversations. We continued to grow. And eventually they said, you know, we'd like to bring this in-house. How would you like to scale your company, which we were a small company, within a much larger company? Uh, and I said, well, that sounds good to me. <laughs> uh, and so that's how, that's how the exit happened. Um, so they put together the, the deal paperwork and we moved into that company and were able to scale that product within the walls of, of Pearson. How did you think about the balance between seeking venture capital versus getting acquired by, by, by Pearson? You know, it was a, a little bit of a gamble, I would say. You know, you, you never know at that particular moment. You only have so much information to go off of. And raising venture capital in education is a really hard thing to do. Um, and yeah. so, and then I thought about the end game, you know, even if I were to grow the company with venture capital money, um, the opportunity to exit like a Pearson doesn't come along all the time. Um, you know, depending on market conditions and other products that they buy, they've got constantly shifting priorities. Um, 
So weighing those two things and saying, okay, an early exit to Pearson, getting experience within that ecosystem, that, that you know, seeing the scale at which a Pearson operates, you know, globally, um, I thought outweighed the advantages of continuing to go it, you know, through the venture route and, and kind of raising money. Because raising money always takes you away from, you know, selling mm-hmm. uh, and running the business until you get to, you know, a big enough stage where there's, you know, enough operations to do that. So, um, so that was the, the bet I made. And I feel to this day that was still the right the right call. No, so, that sounds awesome. You're absolutely yeah. right, Pearson. I mean, what an incredible company to exit to. Yep. Let's talk about the second company. What yeah. was what was kind of the genesis of that idea? Well, um, it was my two kids at the time, so I have three children now. Um, but my oldest uh, daughter was going through fundraising, um, uh, and she had. Um, it was a company that they spon- you sponsor the kids to run around the track. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you know, if you're a parent listening to this, you probably have done this at yeah. some point in time. Um, and I was fine to do that. Um, you know, so I was asking my friends and, and, and family to, you know, s- uh, sponsor uh, my daughter uh, to run around the track as they needed. They were trying to actually build a track. So it wasn't – they had grass and they wanted to put gravel down. And I was like, okay, that sounds like a worthy enough cause. We'll, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, so we – uh, had raised thirty thousand dollars, and there's this big ceremony where they, you know, present you the check. And what I was expecting to see was thirty thousand dollar check, but what I saw was a thirteen thousand dollar check. And the company um, who was putting on this activity uh, took sixty percent of the money that was raised in the fundraiser. And I literally, like, my 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 jaw dropped. I was like, I cannot believe this is legal to take that much money from parents, you know, uh, and they, I didn't know about it. Nobody told me. Um, I was just out there trying to help my kid and what I thought my school. And, and so I felt really kind of disillusioned and disappointed by that whole experience. Yeah. And so I started to kind of dig in and it's like, okay, what, what, why does that happen? You know, what's going on in schools that we're doing this craziness and, and why hasn't it changed along the same time, the, the Pebble watch had come out. I don't know if you remember the Pebble watch, but, um, I was watching this guy have an idea that was so powerful that, you know, he raised $10 million in a couple months for something he hadn't even built yet. It was like a prototype. And people online saw this and believed in it and and gave money to it. And he built it. And, you know, and I got my Pebble watch and I was like, why can't we do something like that for education? Why does it always have to be so hard? Why do I have to, you know, run around the track? Or there was always this disconnect as a parent between what I'm trying to support and what I had to do to support it. Yeah. Um, so I was like, that should be different. <laughs> you know, there, there's, there should be a better way to do that. So I quit my Pearson job and really... Um, went after this idea with a, f- a friend of mine um, out in Southern California named Matt Hartman, who ended up being my co-founder at the company. Um, and he had exited his company to Blackboard uh, six months earlier. And so we were like, all right, let's go let's go solve this problem. Uh, and so we started kind of going through that. And, um, you know, the education space is a tough space. I'll just, you know, I've said that before uh, and I'll say it again now. It, it's just a tough space. So we iterated a ton. You know, we started working with PTAs and realized that that was, you know, that is an interesting problem to solve, but there's not the scale or the, the really the distribution that we needed. Um, and so what the product ended up becoming was a fundraising management tool because that was the bigger problem that districts were having is that there were literally so many fundraisers out there that they had no way to coordinate those activities, uh, to know what was going on in their name. And so the, the product eventually turned into more of a fundraising management. Still in my heart, the problem I'm trying to solve is for parents. It's like, okay, if we can solve those other problems for districts, we can still solve that problem for parents. Um, but I was, um, I was on a panel uh, for South by Southwest, and I came to Capital Factory. So I had, I was one of the incubator companies through Capital Factory, and every time I came in town, I went, I'd go see Josh, and I say, Josh, anybody I should see, anybody I should meet, um, you know, you you tell me where to go, man, and I'll I'll be there. And he was like, actually, um, and he pulls out his phone. And he uh, texts this guy named Dean, Dean Draco. And I had no idea who Dean was at the time. He was just some guy that Josh said, go meet in the morning for, for coffee. And I said, sure. So 
Um, and I tend to do that. Like, I don't always, you know, ask a lot of questions when I trust people who are saying, go meet somebody. I just kind of go do it. You know, it's like that, that event in New York. I just knew I needed to go. And so I did. Uh, could it worked out differently? Yeah, of course. It could have like done nothing for me. And, you know, and, and I, I, I don't know. But so I tend to just go. So I went uh, the next morning and I met with Dean and we were doing a round of money, you know, raising a round of money. Uh, and so I pitched Dean on the, the, the idea and we kind of went back and forth. And six months went by, and we had finished out our round, and we were doing other stuff. And I hadn't heard from Dean, um, and I get a phone call. Um, and I'm in California. Um, I look at the number, and it's an Austin number. And, and so I pick it up, and Dean's like, hey. I'm like, hey, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't talked to you in, you know, six months. What's, what's going on? Um, he was like, how would you, you know, what would you think about becoming the CEO of Living Tree? Uh, and Living Tree was a, a family engagement platform, um, and it had some interesting connections with fundraising because it was kind of in the same space. Um, but my response to him was, uh, "Well, you know, I have a company, Dean. Right? This is, you know, I'm not giving up my gig to go do this." And he says, "Well, what do you think if we merge these two companies together? Um, you know, what if we went out and built like, you know, the next Amazon for parents when it comes to being able to just facilitate one one touch everything? You know, one touch to to go to something, one touch to pay for something, one touch to really." Understand understand what's going on in the classroom. Um, and I loved that vision. So um, we came back, I flew out to Austin the, the next day, and we got a deal together. And uh, we've been off to the races for, for two years. So that's, that's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, uh, that's like the dream scenario, right? Oh, that, my gosh. Yes. Yes. I mean, what do they say? Rather be uh, lucky than right. Uh, <laughs> I was absolutely lucky. Wow. Uh, right place, right time, uh, but also open, you know, to those opportunities. Um, yeah. You know, and you, you never know. You never know where they'll, where they'll go or who will see something or what conversation you're involved in that they may lead you to something down the line. So I'm, I'm curious, like, what are some of the, the you talk about it, it being challenging to grow an ed tech company. Mm -hmm. What are some of those challenges that you experienced? Um. You know, one, you really do need people that understand the growth curve of an ed tech company. You know, if you look at the companies that have been successful, none of them have been, you know, two year to three year horizons. So you're talking, you're talking about a very, uh, it's a longer success cycle for an ed tech company. So with that longer success also means, you know, the amount of cash that you need to survive is also, you know, a little bit, you know, longer tail. Um, so that's that's one, and that's just an alignment on the investor side. So finding the right investors that really understand that, or they have a passion for the the, the topic, um, and really care. So they they really want it to be successful, no matter how long that that might take. Um, the second is really scale. You know, finding distribution channels, finding you know who is your customer. In, you know, is it the school? Is it the district? Um, you know, something that I've seen, you know, recently in ed tech specifically is, you know, the advent of free, you know, lots of free apps, free this, free that, free, you know, free platform. And, you know, as an, as an observer who's not a free platform and watching all this, what I see happening in the ecosystem is just massive chaos because you have, you know, when you talk about education, people say, oh, the U.S. has an education system. And it's like, not really. When you really start digging deep into what's really going on, you have, you know, 14,000 plus, you know, districts. And then you have, you know, 100,000 plus schools. And then you have 4.5 million teachers. And when you get to that 4.5 million teachers, if each one of those have the individual choice to adopt different platforms, imagine the chaos that that creates for the end user for the parents, for the families, right? So this teacher is using one thing, this teacher is using another, this district, you know, this school chose this platform, that school chose another platform, and they're having to navigate all of this. Um, so you have that going on in the school district, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's there's always this this balance of of money and we don't have money and we have money for certain things and there 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 are safe funding formulas haven't adjusted for things that they, you know, should adjust for and so schools are finding ways to be creative and I don't fault them for that, but it also creates massive 
chaos and friction. And so that makes it difficult to break into a market um, when those are the dynamics that are just at play. So interesting. So it sounds like you have a lot of like kind of barriers to entry on one side, but you also have this funding barrier on another. Yes. And, <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm curious, how does that impact one's mindset as an entrepreneur, you know, creating an ed tech company with the ambition of growing, scaling, eventually exiting? Like, how does that influence your dis- your your exit decision, you yeah. know, your exit trajectory, I should say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you look at you know, where, you know, a lot of times what happens with ed tech companies is you start off with a partnership, you start off with a channel sales partnership, and that partnership may go well. Um, and, you know, obviously, if that channel partner's smart, they're going to say, I'm not going to increase your value without having some opportunity to um, participate with you. So, you know, there either be an option to buy or, you know, there's some clause in there that, that says, you know, at a certain point they, they can exercise, you know, however that's structured for, for them. Um, so that's one, one mechanism. Um, you know, the other is, you know, you out the gate. Uh, have the right idea with the right team and the funding to go after it. Um, And you just kind of know that, um, you know, so there are companies who have done that. Most of them who have done that have done that free. So they go down the free model and then they figure out the revenue side uh, later. Um, So it kind of depends. And and they have investors that are uh, supportive of that and they've grown. Like Everfy is a great example of a company that had content and they found corporate sponsors to basically pay for that content. And it was stuff around bullying. It was stuff around corporate finance. And they've done just a phenomenal job um, growing that. And that's free. And I think that those kind of companies are great because, you know, they, they're embedded with the district. They're working with the districts and the schools to provide that content. Where I think the issue is when it's just free and there's no conversation going on with the district or the hmm. parents and, and what, you know, what happens. You know, a lot of times they just don't care what happens because it's about user growth. You know, they can show their investors that we grew, you know, our user base to 2 million in five years. And that's a lot of teachers. That's a lot of eyeballs and bam, their next round of funding hits. So, um, so I think there's a lot of dynamics um, when you're considering, you know, how do we navigate and do, you know, do we position ourselves for an exit? I told you at the onset, I never felt like I was smart enough to really think through all of those things. A lot of times these things evolve over time. You see an opportunity and you're like, that's interesting, yeah. you know, and you get to know them. And I've realized more and more the relational component of that really matters. Um, you know, can I, could, I, could I see myself working with this person, you know, the CEO of that other company? Do I like them enough? Um, because it's kind of like a marriage. You're going to be really close and you're going to go through hard times together and so so you better like be able to <laughs> tolerate this person. <laughs> um, so you know things like that, and sometimes it doesn't work out. Maybe you just have a great partnership with that company. Yeah. Um, but I think those types of things tend to, you know, work well. And in addition to just growing your sales force, growing your team, you know, uh, making sure you've got strong internal mechanisms to to sell product. So one question I ask all my guests is, uh, when is the right time to sell? I would say, you know, for, for based on my personal experience, it's it's right when it's right for you. Um, you know, there are all kinds of reasons why people exit companies, um, and I don't know how much people talk about this in terms of, you know, I don't follow what the advice is on on M and A, um, but you know, it's you kind of know, I think, instinctually, like, all right, is this the right time for us? If there's an offer, obviously, that's a time to consider it, right? <laughs> you know, if someone's is is you know, throwing an offer at you, you know, then you have to consider that. Um, or are you actively putting yourself in a position um, so that people know that you're open to that, mm-hmm. um, that thought, right? And people, investors will ask that, companies will ask that, you know, like, oh, what are you, how are you? And some people are like, nope, I'm, I'm on my path and, you know, we're not ready and we're not even close to thinking about that. And, and it's okay, okay, fine. That's, you know, five years down the road, but they're also making a bet that everything's going to work out the way that they, they thought it was. So, um, it's. I feel like a balancing act, and as the CEO of the company, you know that. You know, all right, is this the best path forward um, at this time if you get an offer for my company, for me personally, for my team, um, for the product and the people we serve? Is this like the best way to scale this idea that we have to get it into as many hands as possible? Um, with Pearson, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, man, I could have this in 
every student hand, you know, student, parent and student's hands, every administrator's hands through uh, a company like uh, or, or a product like PowerSchool, uh, who had, you know, a huge install base. And so that was for me at that moment. Yes, absolutely. That is totally worth worth it for me. Um, so I think it's very individual. At you know, um, they're obviously you know the bigger you get, the more you have shareholders, uh, the more you have investors that are going to tell you, you know, this is the this is the right time. <laughs> you need to look at this. We need to position ourselves. Um, but again, I think you know some of it just comes down to your own your your own gut and your own feeling about it. So. What role did your board and investors play during these process? During this process of the acquisition and the merger, uh, I, they have been incredibly, incredibly helpful. Um, you know, so I was lucky to have um, in the first company not as much because I wasn't, I just didn't know as many people. But in the second company with Ed Backer, I had an amazing board and board of advisors. Um, you know, Craig Cummings, who's a, a local um, Austin guy. So him and Joseph Kopser, who had Ride Scout. Um, Craig is like my Yoda. Uh, you know, for when it comes to business, you know, he exited to Daimler for, you know, a, a, he had a significant exit, um, and so he was incredibly helpful. Uh, another guy by the name of Chris Hoyt was, you know, helping me through. And these guys have done, you know, 50 deals. Um, so they were helping me navigate the nuances of the contract and what does that mean for you and what does that mean for your company. And um, yeah, Michael Chasen was also on there. And so, you know, I just had a really strong wealth of knowledge of people who have done this, you know, many, many, many times. And so it made me feel comfortable, you know, making the right decision uh, as we kind of navigated those waters. So, yeah, I mean, we it, it was happening over Thanksgiving through, yeah, <laughs> through like uh, the holidays. Oh, perfect timing. Yeah, perfect timing. <laughs> My wife was very appreciative of that. Uh, so, I mean, we spent significant hours like every day working through stuff. You know, we had our investors and we had to get everybody to sign paperwork and we're trying to get to a close before January 1. And so it was just a mask of chaos and emails and getting stuff out the door and, um, uh, but we got it done. Yeah. You know, you got it. We got it over the line, and uh, everybody was happy with the result. So. Yeah. Um, what were some of the maybe like the more challenging parts of the process that kind of frustrated you? You know, I, I think sometimes um, in, in retrospect, what I wish we would have done is gotten around a table as a team um, and really kind of hashed through some of these finer points mm-hmm. um, and talked it through. A lot of the stuff we were doing initially was via email exchange and. You know, I have nothing against lawyers. I know you need a good lawyer, uh, but sometimes it's good to have that one-to-one conversation and guide your attorney to like, hey, this is my feeling about how this is going. Here's where I think we can push hard and where I I don't think we can. And and they'll give you advice and say, no, you absolutely have to push hard on this particular thing. So no, I'm not going to let you do that. (laughs) Um, But I think those kind of conversations would have been better if I had just had more Mm in-person time. Um, and so, you know, if I were to exit again, I would make sure that, you know, I'm in communication, text, voice, conversations, and then guide the, the, the attorneys through the process as opposed to, you know, the other way around. So, yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. What advice would you have to, to business owners thinking of selling their company? Um, you know, I think that I, I, I thought you might ask me this question. I wasn't sure how I would answer it. <laughs> you can take your, take your time if you want to think about it. You know, yeah. I, I do a little bit because I think that in some ways there's there's enormous value. Like the companies that I admire, um, some of them have never exited. You know, they've grown and they've, they've built their team over time. And I really, really admire that. Um, but it that is a that can be a very gut wrenching process to do that right so um, so I think as a as a entrepreneur like looking through and saying okay I think the goal should always be to grow a great company that provides value to your to your customers you know keep take, take care of your team take care of your investors take care of your customers um, and as opportunities come don't you know, don't shy away from them. Have every conversation. You never know where it's going to go. It may lead to nothing. It may lead to a great partnership. It may be that's going to be your acquirer two years down the road. They've gotten to know you. They like you. Um, Craig always told me this. He's like, investors look for three things. And the first thing they look for is they got to like you. 
uh, and then they got to think you're competent, and then they think they got to think that you can execute. Um, and he's like, don't us underestimate number one though. <laughs> they got to like you. Yeah. Um, so, and that's relational. Uh, and so, you know, always be building those relationships with people. Um, and then when it comes time, evaluate with the information you have. And then once you make that decision, make the decision and, and move forward. Don't look back on it and, and wonder, oh, was it the right time? It, you know, you have information in your hand, make that decision and go from there. That's great advice. Yeah. Where can people go to learn more about your company, Living Tree? Yes, if uh, you'd like to learn more about Living Tree, go to uh, www.livingtree.com, um, or you can find me uh, on LinkedIn at uh, whatever the LinkedIn extension <laughs> is, <laughs> forward slash uh, Gary Hensley. Awesome. Gary, thank you so much for your time today. Mark, thanks for having me.